Hello, BookTube. I've got some new books to show you uh, that were opened off camera. <laughs> Uh, I thought you might want to see them anyway. They'll be in your bookstores. They might be of interest to you. In fact, as we've often seen on this channel, they might be of more interest to you than they are to me. Some of them. Uh, so I wanted to know you were out there. We'll look them around. We'll look them over. We'll read something about them. That, that's just part of this channel. Uh, and the first batch of them are murder mysteries. We love murder mysteries, of course. You've often heard that on this channel, especially connected with a BookTube event, March Mystery Madness, where I have often been one of the hosts. And I just recently learned that there is, uh, you may have seen some videos, announcement videos in your, in your booktube feed of mid-year mystery madness. Uh, Elizabeth at Lizzie Faye Loves Books uh, thought about making an event sort of in September, in the second week of September, to uh, keep mysteries in mind, to keep people thinking about mysteries until we get to March Mystery Madness. So we're doing mid-year Mystery Madness and this, the, the theme this time around. You don't, of course, have to abide by it. You, you just, uh, you might want to check in. You'll certainly be seeing videos on BookTube about mid-year Mystery Madness in the second week of September, I think the 12th or the 18th. Uh, and the, the sort of theme for this little mini event to sort of to remind you of March Mystery Madness is uh, subgenre September. Uh, pick a subgenre of murder mysteries, of and and read that and have a, have a ball with it. And I don't know, I, I'm not all that familiar with the books we're going to be seeing here, so I'm not sure how many of them qualify as subgenre. Surely every murder mystery qualifies in some way or other as a subgenre. Like this first one. This first one is part of a series that I know well. And it is definitely a subgenre, the subgenre of historical murder mystery, which I love. This is a fantastic series. I can't recommend it enough. This is by James Ben, and this is his new Billy Boyle World War II mystery. Uh, this is called Road of Bones, with the classic vintage covers that have been with this series from the beginning. This comes out on September 7th. Uh, Billy, Billy Boyle, the main character here, is sent to the heart of the USSR to solve a double murder with a, at a critical turning point in the war. It's September 1944, and the U.S. is poised to launch Operation Frantic, a shuttle bombing mission to be conducted by American aircraft based in Great Britain, southern Italy, and the three Soviet airfields in the Ukraine. Tensions are already high between the Americans and the Russian allies when two intelligence agents, one Soviet, one American, are found dead at Poltava, one of the Ukrainian bases. Billy is brought in to investigate, and this time he's paired, at the insistence of the Soviets, with a KGB agent who has his own political and personal agenda. Uh, in the course of the investigation that quickly spirals out of control, Billy is aided by the Night Witches, a daring regiment of young Soviet women flying at night on very low altitudes, bombing hundreds of German installations. And the Night Witches had a great, a couple of years ago, they had a great nonfiction book and a great novel, a great historical novel. Uh, so finding them again in this book is, is going to be extra enjoyable. And also, one of the joys of this series is watching Billy Boyle lock horns with new characters. That's often not the case with ongoing historical stories, or often the case is that the real comfort comes in uh, the familiar characters, right? Think Janet Ivanovich. You, 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 the real comfort in those books and books like those comes from revisiting the old cast. But this writer excels at putting his main character, Billy Boyle, in new situations. And you just love it. You just love watching him react. So that is September 7th, and that definitely qualifies as subgenre September. That is historical murder mysteries. Uh, so let's see about this next one. Uh, this next one comes out in December. So too late for uh, uh, mid-year mystery madness, but still be of interest to some of you. Let's see what we have here. This comes out from the folks at Soho Crime, uh, and this is going to be a hardcover, twenty-seven ninety-five, and it is. To, the author is Teresa Doval Page, and the uh, the title is Death Under the Perseids, a Havana mystery. Lovely cover there. Uh, Cuban American author Teresa Doval Page paints a an intricate, revealing portrait of modern Cuba in this addictively clever new Havana mystery about a free cruise ship vacation that proves too good to be true. Cuban-born Mercedes Spivy and her American husband Nolan find a five-day cruise, win a five-day cruise to Cuba. 
Although the circumstances surrounding the prize seem a little suspicious to Mercedes, Nolan's current unemployment and their need to revamp their marriage make the decision a no-brainer. Oh my, <laughs> I know this is just a fun murder mystery, but I want to put this out there for anyone who may need to hear it. You cannot revamp or revitalize your marriage with a trip. It can't be done. <laughs> so don't try it. Just don't try it. Take the money that you would have spent on the trip and all of the fripperies involved. Take that huge sum of money and invest in a couples counselor. That might work. That has a 15% chance of working. A, a vacation of any kind not only has a 100% chance of not working, it will certainly hasten the demise of the marriage. So don't do it. Don't do what, what Mercedes and Nolan are doing. Uh, once aboard, Mercedes is surprised to see two people she met through her ex-boyfriend Lorenzo. Former University of Havana, of Havana professor Selfa Segara and down-on-his-luck Spanish writer Javier Gerardo. Even stranger, they also received a free cruise. Oh, I'm loving this already. When Selfia, when Selfa disappears in their first day at sea, Mercedes and Javier begin to wonder if their presence on the cruise is more than a mere coincidence, you think? <laughs> Worried, Mercedes confides her suspicions to her husband, who, desperate to accept a last-minute invitation he received to give a lecture at Havana University, convinces her it's all in her head. Thinking he's not long for this world. <laughs> However, when Javier dies, oh no, I was already attached to Javier. When Javier dies under mysterious circumstances after disembarking in Havana, and Nolan is nowhere to be found, Mercedes scrambles through the city looking for him, fearing her suspicions were correct all along. Okay, <laughs> all right, fantastic. Well, I uh, I am on board. I don't know if is this the author's debut? <laughs> was born in Havana, Cuba, earned her BA in English literature and her MA in Spanish literature at the University of Havana, and her PhD in Latin American uh, literature at the University of New Mexico. Oh no, she's the author of thirteen other works of fiction and three plays. Okay, and she lives in New Mexico. All right, so this is not her first book, but this is the first book in the series, uh, and. It also is a mystery subgenre. Like I said, virtually anything that you're going to find is going to be a subgenre of some kind. And this would be the location mystery, right? Uh, where there's an exotic location that is evoked and that is a very active part of the story. So, uh, then what have we got next here? Okay, this is a veteran crime writer. Uh, this is also from Soho Press. Uh, and this is coming out in mid October. Uh, as a 2795 hardcover. This, the author is Peter Lovesy. A lot of you will know him. A lot of you will love his work. And his, this is his new book. It's a Peter Diamond investigation, and it's called Diamond and the Eye. In this case, I believe it's Private Eye. Uh, Diamond and the Eye. Uh, it, this is the 20th installment in the award-winning Peter Diamond series. Uh, you do not have to read them in order. You can jump right into this book. Uh, so don't let that intimidate you. Uh, and it offers an, uh, an ever-charming, often side-splitting send-up of his beloved genre. Bath police detective Peter Diamond suffers no fools. Uh, and in this book, his nightmare has come to pass. He has to collaborate with the most preposterous kind of fool he can imagine. The self-styled Johnny Gets. His business card says he gets results. <laughs> He's a private investigator who's been hired to track down her missing father, who's... Uh, is Johnny a, a woman? Uh, whose case Diamond has been assigned by the Avon and Somerset murder squad. Getz is a Philip Marlowe wannabe, complete with a ridiculous private eye duds and a frustratingly high and inaccurate opinion of his detection skills. But is Johnny Getz's real job to find a missing victim or to stymie Diamond's progress? Is it possible that he's been inflicted on the case specifically in order to hamper our hero's effectiveness? In this celebration of the mystery genre and a century of its greatest practitioners and most outrageous heroes, Peter Lovesy still manages to pull off the trick that has made him a legend among modern crime fiction writers. He delivers a perfect Golden Age style puzzle mystery, ripping with unforgettable one-liners and slapstick adventure, and glistening with brilliantly drawn secondary characters. Uh, and this is most definitely another subgenre. This is Golden Age pastiche. Effectively Golden Age pastiche, although the uh, the uh, Diamond novels that I've read, they might start out that way, they might have some trappings along those lines, but they are f just fully fantastic on their own. They're, they're, they stop feeling like a dutiful homage, and you just get caught up in them. So Diamond and the Eye, it's the latest one. Bean. 
You have to stop slurping, baby. You're slurping in every video. I can't have you slurp in every video, baby. I can't. I will turn her into... <laughs> I will turn her into central casting. Uh, and get an, an obedient German Shepherd for the next video. Don't you worry. <laughs> so this next one I think we've seen before on this channel. I think we saw the advanced copy of it. This is the finished copy. I have no no sheet for it, so we'll just read from the dust jacket. Oh no, baby, there's there's a pile of books there, baby. You just have to stay up here for you. You have to stay up here just for another minute. There you go. And this is Anne Cleves. Uh, this is a Detective Matthew Venn novel. I think we saw an advanced copy of this. This is the the lovely finished copy of The Heron's Cry. There you have the manor on the hill. You've got the surf breaking against the wall there. You've got the houses down here. Uh, so what have we got here? North Devon is enjoying a rare hot summer. They aren't going to be rare for long. They aren't rare already. They aren't going to stay rare. They will never be rare again. Now, oh, baby, oh God, all right, let me get this out of your way so that you can fly down onto the floor. Go on. There you go. Uh, <laughs> this is going to want to come back up here in a minute. Uh, Anyway, we won't go on a, cri a climate crisis digression. We'll just keep going. Uh, and Detective Matthew Venn is called out to investigate a murder at the rural home of a group of artists. What he discovers is, is an elaborately staged scene. Dr. Nigel Yeo, Y-E-O, has been fatally stabbed with a shard of one of his glassblower daughter's vases. So the, the daughter makes vases, and he's been stabbed with part of one of them. Uh, Dr. Yeo seems like an unlikely, an unlikely victim, a good man, a public servant, beloved by his daughter Eve. Matthew is unnerved, though, to find out that Eve is close friends with his husband, Jonathan. It also comes to light that Dr. Yeo has been investigating the suicide of a young man before he died. Uh, be, I was presuming before both of them died is what we're talking about here. Then another man is found killed in the same way. Matthew must tread carefully through the lies that fester at the heart of his community, in a, da in a case dangerously close to home. Uh, so this is, uh, it's a police, it's a police detective mystery, not an amateur detective. And it's also a location mystery. This, is, this probably has the least claim to subgenre September that, uh, of any of the things we've seen so far. Uh, but that's a blast of murder mysteries in a row there. And, and they are designed to remind you among, you know, whether or not to, to entice you to get them when they come out. Uh, Heron's Cried, I don't have a slip for. I'm assuming it comes out in September. Uh, in addition to all that, it's designed to remind you of March Mystery Madness. We're getting a little a little pin in the calendar mini event in September. Uh, and then we'll finish up with two other books that aren't murder mysteries. Uh, and the first one, it deals with an upcoming event. Of course, September 11th, 2021 is the anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks on Lower Manhattan and the Pentagon and Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Uh, and this is a reissue of Tower Stories uh, that was an oral history of, of that day. So uh, who is the publisher here? Santa Monica Press is coming out with a new issue, a new reissue of Tower Stories uh, that is an, an oral history of the day. So uh, accounts that people gave, many, many people, including a handful of people who got out of one of the towers alive before it came down. Uh, but also bystanders of all kinds, paramedics, uh, local food vendors, local news people, and I believe that this edition has been updated uh, with later stuff. Let's, let's see what we have here. Um, yes, uh, some of the stories preserved from earlier editions feature the small group of people who miraculously made it safely down from the 89th floor of Tower 1. Uh, the New York Times reporter who desperately fought her way through the fleeing crowds to get back to Lower Manhattan. A paramedic who set up a triage area 200 yards from the base of the towers before they collapsed. Uh, and the bereaved citizens of New York City who struggled to get on with their lives in the days and months following the tragic event, among dozens of others. Uh, and I don't remember... I'm, this comes out... Uh, it's out already. This, this came out in late August. I don't remember when the first edition of Tower Stories came out. I believe it was uh, very soon after. Uh, just, just this is just oral accounts from people. It's not meant to be uh, rise and fall, for instance. That great book uh, that is a history 
Uh, this is meant to be just oral histories. And I read an earlier edition of this a long time ago and was just tremendously moved. The details that just jump out at you, just tremendously moved. I think what moved me more in my first reading than anything else wasn't the, the, the trauma in the moment. Rather, it was the many stories that we just mentioned there of people who were just trying to get on with their lives. Thousands and thousands of people had to just get on with their lives without a body, without anything, without any actual confirmation that their loved one was dead. You, you saw at, nine, at Ground Zero, pages, missing persons pages went up by the thousands. Families, okay, well, so and so went what went to down to Lower Manhattan that morning, and never came back, and it's been twenty years, and the, the, he or she has not come back, so they obviously died at nine in the nine eleven attack. Did a gigantic filing cabinet blow out of a window on the ninetieth floor and kill someone below? And the body just got lost under the rubble, crushed under the rubble, pulverized atomized under the rubble? What about all the people who were working, the janitorial staff, maybe a guest who wasn't on the registers, who wasn't supposed to be there? I think those stories got to me more than any other. The people people who just could not, had nothing to do with their grief. Just, it was a process of inference that they had lost a loved one. Imagine that. For most of us, it's an absolute de deduction. You know for sure. But for thousands of people, it was an inference that they'd lost someone that day. So this may end up being one of the most powerful books that I read or reread for the anniversary. I'm gonna do a huge amount of reading for the anniversary. Uh, but anyway, Tower Stories, this came out in August. Uh, it's Santa Monica Press, so I'm not sure that it's, that's a big enough press to be in your bookstores. So all the more important, if, you, if this resonates with you, this subject, for you to know that this is out there, you know? it can be ordered you can get this from your bookstore or from your library or from amazon so uh just wanted to know it was there tower stories uh and then the last one we'll, we'll end on a lighter note the last one is uh an author a lot like in, in another mail hall today we saw nathaniel philbrick uh and I, I know that name will be familiar to a lot of you and a lot of you will immediately smile when you see that name because you know you can't go wrong with him you know you're in good hands he is a historian who wants to please you not by telling you sugared truths, but by entertaining you while he instructs you. And a lot of historians forget that. He never forgets that. So his books are always wonderful. And this next author is the exact same way. She will, she will impart to you in the course of a book a ton of expository information, but you will love the experience without fail. Uh, and that author is Mary Roach. And this is her new book, which is kind of up Steve's alley. It's called Fuzz when nature breaks the law. You can't really tell on camera, but that badge on the front is raised and felted like it was on the sleeve of someone's jacket. Fuzz, when nature breaks the law. And this is, this is about everything from uh, nuisance birds to squirrels in the attic, all the way up to murders, to, to animals killing human beings. Uh, so let me read you a little bit about it here so you know. This comes out in September in finished copy. Uh, what's to be done with a jaywalking moose? A bigger problem than you would think, because moose will freeze in the headlights. They, they won't, their instincts don't tell them to bolt away. They'll freeze, and believe you me, if you don't believe me, ask Mark Richardson up in Vermont. If you hit a moose with your car, it's going to be bad for the moose. It's going to be equally bad for you. <laughs> believe you me, if you hit something that weighs a ton and a half. Uh, anyway, uh, a bear caught breaking and entering, a murderous tree, 300 years ago, animals that broke the law would be assigned legal representation and put on trial. Uh, these days, as New York Times bestselling author Mary Roach discovers, the answers are best found not in jurisprudence, but in science. The curious science of human-wildlife conflict, a discipline at the crossroads of human behavior and wildlife biology. Uh, discipline we're learning more about all the time. I can't wait to read this book. We're, we know more and more about preventability all the time. And one of the best parts of the changing zeitgeist of, excuse me, of the 21st century is that more and more people are realizing that the heart and soul of preventability is to alter human behavior, not animal behavior. It's, it's it, of course, totally wrong to kill animals just because they're in your way. But it, the way to avoid mis misunderstandings or tragedies is to alter human behavior. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, Roach tags along with the Animal Attack Forensics Investigators, Human Element Conflict Specialists, Bear Manners, and Danger Tree Faller Blasters. Intrepid as ever, she travels from leopard-terrorized hamlets in the Indian Himalayas to St. Peter's Square in the early hours before the Pope arrives for Easter Mass when vandal gulls swoop in to destroy the elaborate floral display. She taste tests rat bait, learns how to install a vulture effigy, and gets mugged by a macaque. <laughs> I saw macaques be a problem all over India. I, all, all over the place, just roving packs of them, where the tourists, American tourists, overweight American tourists in unflattering shirts and very unflattering shorts, would think they were cute and get too close and not behave in an admonitory way. The macaques will take anything. They'll grab the bag off your shoulder and they'll be gone with it. And if your, if your passport is in there, if your wallet is in there, you'll never see it again. Uh, I, was never, I never had that problem myself. I encountered those troops of, of macaques, baboons in Africa. I encountered troops like that all the time. I never had a problem myself because I had a pack of dogs with me at all times. And that just isn't good. They won't come anywhere near. They might, they might have grown fat on lazy, uh, oblivious tourists. But a group of dogs? No, I'm not going to risk that at all. So I never had a problem with it. Uh, combining little-known forensic science and conservation genetics with a motley cast of laser scarecrows, langer impersonators, uh, and trespassing squirrels, Roche reveals as much about humanity as about nature's lawbreakers. When it comes to the problem wildlife she finds, humans are more often the problem. Totally agree. And the solution. Fascinating, witty, and humane, Fuzz offers hope for compassionate coexistence in our ever-expanding human habitat. So this comes out... Do I have a slip on this? I think I do. Yes, I do. Uh, this comes out... Um, Okay, it's not a helpful slip. This is the one piece of information that anyone who's getting this pub sheet wants to know should be on the front of the pub sheet. You shouldn't have to dig around for it. It's the only piece of information that anyone looking at this wants to know. And that is when does the book come out? What is the release date for the finished copy? Uh, but I finally got to it, and it's uh, September 14th. Uh, so this com uh, the new Mary Roach comes out on September 14th. So now, for those of you who know this author, uh, that's all you need to hear is the new Mary Roach. That'll be enough for you to reserve it at your library, reserve it at your bookstore, pre-order it from Amazon or whatever. Uh, those of you who don't know this author, read a couple of her books and you will be that. You will, you will be transformed. Same thing with Nathaniel Philbrick. You'll be transformed to someone who just can't wait for the new book. When the new book comes out, the publishing world has, what, 30, 35 Writers who are like this, they're just absolutely known phenomenon that you they will not let you down. A lot of you think that way about David Sedaris. Uh, he's never really done it for me, but I recognize him as one of those authors. And Mary Roach is another. So her new book, Fuzz, When Animals Break the Law, uh, is coming out in mid-September. So there you go. That is a sort of an extra new book day. We have Fuzz by Mary Roach. We have Tower Stories uh, by Damon DiMarco. I don't think I ever said that the first time. Uh, we have uh, The Heron's Cry by Anne Cleves. We have Diamond and the Eye by the legendary Peter Lovesy. Uh, we have Death Under the Perseids, the Perseid Meteor Showers, what that's referring to, uh, by Teresa Doval Page. Uh, and we have uh, Road of Bones uh, by James Ben, in which his main character encounters a, his Soviet counterpart. Uh, that's going to be so much fun. That, that, that right there, that's enough to sell you. Uh, so there you go. A few new books to tide you over on a boiling hot Friday. 110 degrees Fahrenheit in Boston. Boiling hot. Just crushing. So that if you are in the this this heat wave, it's not being called a heat wave in the news, but today today's heat is extending over most of the eastern half of the United States. If you are subject to this heat, Protect yourself, okay? Be gentle with yourself. There's nothing normal about this kind of heat at this time of year. So protect yourself, right? Wear a hat when you're outside. It's probably the number one thing, keep in mind. Your brain, your human brain, is the most complex brain that's ever been developed in the history of life on this planet, as far as we can tell. It, it consumes an enormous amount of energy and is very sensitive to the heat. So cover it. Don't have the sun beating down on it. Even if you've got lovely wavy hair like mine, cover it with a hat and make sure you hydrate. 
I know it sounds like a very poncy 21st century fitness influencer type thing to do, but make sure that you are drinking water throughout the day. Don't drink just when you're really thirsty. When you're really thirsty, that is your body's way of saying you are already dehydrated. So don't do that. Keep a steady flow of cool water. Uh, and try to stay out of the sun. Try to stay in air conditioning if you can. Uh, because I don't want to lose a single one of you. Except Brian at Bookish. <laughs> I'll advise him to go for a marathon. <laughs> I don't think anybody believes that anymore. I'll have to find a new arch enemy. <laughs> anyway, some new books for you, including some mysteries. Keep your eye peeled for a bunch of uh, mid-year mystery madness announcement videos. Uh, and we'll be talking about murder mysteries in September, absolutely. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up and take it easy myself. <laughs> so I will see you soon. Thank you, BookTube.